Okay, we can start. Then he'll join. Okay. <clears throat> Good, good afternoon, um, Madam President, panelists, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I want to assume that everything is clear at your end, that everybody can hear me uh, very loudly and clearly because I'm the first speaking. So I'll have to do the mic check, so to speak, to be sure that the audience is on board. So I appreciate if somebody in the audience just puts a message to say, yes, it's clear. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, sir. So you're welcome to um, another in, in the webinar series of the Nigerian Academy of Science. Uh, we've had quite a few in the last two years when they, they have started an epidemic of webinars as well, not just COVID, uh, but the Academy also has been on board uh, hosting webinars, including bilingual uh, webinars in French and English. So it's a pleasure to welcome you once again to this webinar. And um, the webinar is about the uh, draw that changed the management of diabetes uh, in humans, you know, and that is the discovery of insulin you know, the discovery of insulin about a hundred years ago. And that's why we tag, we tag this celebrating the insulin centennial and enduring legacy for science. And we expect that this should go on for about two hours. We will be over. The Nigerian Academy of Science is the foremost independent scientific body in Nigeria. Um, and indeed the third oldest in Africa of such academies, sometimes regarded as a second. You know, we have Madagascar, Ghana, Nigeria. Uh, sometimes people don't talk about Madagascar at all. You know, so it's uh, Ghana, Nigeria. And uh, it's a leading academy in West Africa and indeed Africa, uh, helping not just to uh, advise, you know, gives what we know technically, what is not technically a science advice, uh, in Africa, in Nigeria, but also helping uh, to strengthen and develop academies across the continent. Uh, it was founded in 1977, and currently, because of its uh, strict merit-based admission or election into membership, uh, it has just under 300 members since 1977 uh, that have been successfully elected. We, the Academy of Science has two primary purposes. One is honorific, which is to honor scientific excellence and primarily election of fellows or the election of scientists, distinguished scientists as fellows of the Academy of Science. So they use the appellation FAS behind their names. Uh, but also there is the award of prizes to other scientists, not, who are not fellows, uh, for good work done, especially our flag the Nigeria Gold Medal of Science that the Academy awards every year uh, to deserving scientists for specific work that they've done. Uh, but secondly, uh, apart from the honorific role is that role of science advice where the Academy brings its expertise and its network uh, of scientists to, to bear on policy making in Nigeria and beyond. Uh, providing advice to government and other stakeholders. Um, and that is one of the things that is being done today. Um, we also, of course, uh, indirectly, we also, or directly perhaps, also promoting the development of science by sharing uh, relevant scientific knowledge. Uh, so that's, it's my pleasure again. Once again, I have said it that as an introduction to the Academy for those who are joining us. Uh, from far and near. We're happy that you are here. And um, I, that's a little brief on the Academy. I'll invite you uh, to visit our website, which is www.nas.org.ng. It's also a bit under reconstruction, but it's working. Uh, so if you see a bit of a little here and there, that's not the way it should be. It's currently being worked on. Okay, but it should have the information you need 
uh, including contact information for reaching out to the academy office uh, to get more information if you so wish. Um, having said that, it's my pleasure to invite now the president of the Academy of Science, uh, it, I mean, former vice chancellor, two time vice chancellor of, of universities in Nigeria, and the first female president that the Academy has had since 1977, a distinguished parasitologist and biologist. Uh, in the person of Professor Ekanem Braid FAS for her opening remarks. Thank you, Thank you Doi. Um, good afternoon, all. Chairman of this event, fellows of the Nigerian Academy of Science, panelists, participants, ladies and gentlemen. It's again my pleasure to welcome you to this yet another webinar hosted by the Nigerian Academy of Science. Um, the executive secretary has, has told you a bit about the academy, but let me add that since inception, the Nigerian Academy of Science has remained the apex science body in Nigeria. We are committed to the development and advancement of science, technology, and innovation in Nigeria. And in line with our mandate, we continue to assist government in addressing national problems that can be solved by application of science, technology, and innovation. We also work hard at maintaining highest standards of scientific endeavors and achievements in Nigeria. This we do through a number of activities and interventions uh, we have sustained the publication of a highly rated journal, Proceedings of the Nigerian Academy of Science, and we invite you to publish in it. We have also continued to host conferences, seminars, workshops, symposia, webinars like the one we are having today on topical issues. The webinar we are hosting today is themed celebrating the insulin centennial and enduring legacy for science. Yes, it's been a hundred years since insulin was discovered. And as the foremost science body in Nigeria, we see the need to celebrate this giant leap. This celebration offers us opportunity to refresh our minds about the science behind the isolation of insulin from the dog pancreas by the duo of Frederick Banting and Charles Herbert Best working in the laboratory of JJR McLeod University of Toronto. It also affords us the opportunity to appreciate this discovery that has transformed diabetes from a dreaded fatal disease to a chronic condition that can be managed. Coincidentally, this webinar is holding at a time when the Nigerian Academy of Science is making concerted efforts to develop the land allocated to her years back by government. The webinar therefore jolts us into action to speedily complete the NAS Science Museum on this land in Abuja. That will be the appropriate location for the static display of the story of insulin and other stories as well as objects related to natural history, paleontology, geology, industry, and industrial machinery. That we will do in order to ensure that upcoming generations have opportunity to learn from the past and appreciate the importance of science in sustainable development. We appreciate our past president who is our chairman today for agreeing to chair this webinar I'm not sure he's here yet with us, but he'll be here. Professor Bayomi Akonje, FAS, a fellow of the Nigerian Academy of Science, actually initiated the hosting of this webinar, and we thank him for that. He's in diaspora, but sometime he'll come down to join us in some of our activities here. So Prof Akonje will take us through the history of the discovery and the use of insulin. We are grateful to Dr. Sonny Kuku, FAS, who will talk us through the through diabetes in Nigeria, his experiences, 
and to Professor Samuel Diagogo Jack, whom I like to refer to as a friend of NAS, who will give us a hundred year forecast on insulin. I thank all the participants on this call and invite you to participate in our future events. Please, like the executive secretary has said, visit our website where you will learn more about the Nigerian Academy of Science. Obviously much more information than this five minutes address allows me to provide. I wish you all a rewarding experience at this webinar. Thank you, and out. Thank you, Thank you very much, Madam President. Um, I'm not sure if I have that right, uh, but we are happy to have Dr. Gabriel Wife for taking the third lecture. I think that was a little mistake in the name there. Um, but also apologies, uh, Professor Gabriel Gumola, who is past president and moderator for this meeting, Really is in um, some issues with his connections, uh, but he's working on it, and I expect he'll join us in a few minutes. Uh, in the interim, because once he comes in, I'll basically hand over to him, so I'll still tell you who he is, so that you know ahead. And uh, when I sign off and hand over to him, uh, he would de definitely be well recognized and known already. So, Professor Gabriel Gumolai Fias uh, is the past president of the Nigerian Academy of Science. Chancellor and Chairman Board of Trustees of Leeds City University in Ibadan. He graduated with a BSc degree in Physical Chemistry, of course, a Professor of Chemistry uh, at the University of Ibadan. He was many things, including a Rocky Fellow Postdoctoral Research Fellow uh, with Professor Britton Chance at the Research Foundation at the University of Pennsylvania, 1969-70, that's quite a while. And, uh, he was appointed as an endowed chair of Ulua Linsin Professor of Applied Chemistry in recognition of his achievements in applied chemistry in 1989. Uh, he was elected. He was the past president of the academy, but he was elected into the academy in 1981 and has served severally on the council of the academy in different capacities uh, before being uh, president in 20, 2003 to 2006. And even now, he has been very active, uh, serving on several committees uh, of the academy. And he also served on the Presidential Science and Technology Advisory Council of Nigeria, uh, I think, under the tenure of Professor Lucia, I mean, of President Lucia Gobaso Jordan. Uh, so, Professor Gumala will take over as soon as he connects. I've been on the phone with him, and they're working on the challenges there. So, once he does, I will stop. Uh, and let you know that he's taking over. But today we're happy to have the first presentation um, as the president has taken us through an agenda. Uh, we have a first presentation from Professor Abayomi Akonji, FAS, who will be telling us about insulin 1922 to 2022. He's an academic physician scientist an endocrinologist and a chemical pathologist. Uh, Professor Abayo Miyakoji qualified as a physician from the medical school in Ibadan. He subsequently obtained the Doctor of Philosophy DPhil degree from Oxford University, UK. He had his residency and specialist training at the University College Hospital Ibadan and the University of Oxford Hospitals. Uh, Professor Akonji holds fellowships of various bodies he is a fellow of the Nigerian Academy of Science and a foundation fellow of the Academy of Medicine. Currently, he's a foundation professor and former chair of medical sciences at the Frank Netta MD Medical School of Cunipiac University, Amden, Connecticut, USA. His current research interests are in molecular endocrinology, that's nutrition and chronic disease, and also in medicine. Education. So please uh, welcome th this afternoon, Professor Bayomi Akoji, FAS, for his presentation. Over to you, sir. I think you're still muted. Sir. Okay. Um, 
Thank you very much. I'll jam my screen. That's okay. It's fine. Okay, uh, uh, President Braid, uh, Executive Secretary of Dubanjo, fellows, colleagues, friends, uh, good morning from the US East Coast. Um, and thank you very much again, uh, Dr. Dubanjo, for your kind introduction. It's uh, indeed gratifying that the NAS leadership brought into the idea of joining the global scientific community in the celebration of the centennial of the discovery of insulin one of the great medical miracles of all time. As you all know, uh, insulin, this incredible biologic, transforms certain death into resurrection. In its uh, 100 years, it turned a hitherto uncontrollable disease into the manageable chronic diabetes of today. And I think it is appropriate that we are paying due centennial by this tribute to this incredible drug. I will start off by delving into the global experience with insulin in the past 100 years. And Dr. Gabriel Waifo will gaze into the crystal ball for answers for the next 100 years. Our senior colleague, Dr. Olorogunkuku, will domesticate and contextualize issues to practice in Nigeria. Uh, as you would expect, our presentations and discussions will be global and at a relatively high level. And uh, our target audience hopefully includes not only fellows of the academy, but also practicing physicians and endocrinologists, resident doctors, and basic and clinical scientists. In my own time, I will start with a bird's eye view of diabetes as a major health problem. Then I will give a retrospective of the events that happened in Toronto during the summer of 1921, and that ultimately led to insulin's characterization, purification, and clinical use. I will anecdotally describe the principal characters, their rivalries, and the controversies that surrounded the 1923 Nobel Prize for Physiology and Medicine. I will then review the structural modifications of the insulin molecule that have in the last 100 years enhanced its efficacy in optimizing diabetes care. To me, this has indeed been the enduring legacy of science, a classic romance of basic with clinical sciences involving fields as diverse as surgery, protein chemistry, analytical biochemistry, endocrinology, pharmacology, molecular biology, biomedical engineering, bioethics, as well as uh, global marketing and politics. It is also a fascinating story that also unfortunately further exposed the global inequities in healthcare access and delivery. I'm gonna end my talk on those issues, including where insulin might be by December 2022. Allow me to spice my presentation with some of my biases that have been acquired over the 35 or so years that I've been in diabetes research and practice. So moving on to my slides. Uh, I don't have any disclosures, uh, but I would, I would like to give due courtesy to some organizations that have with us celebrated the insulin centennial. This would include the Endocrine Society, you know, the American Diabetes Association, the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists, the International Diabetes Federation, uh, and of course, global companies like Novo Nordisk and uh, Sanofi and Eli Lidi. I will also refer to the websites of these major organizations and also make reference to uh, webinars that are widely available that have looked at a hundred years of innovation in insulin therapy. And that have also looked at how diabetes care will be transformed through insulin. 
I will make reference to endocrine reviews, a thematic issue on the sentinel of insulin. And this came out in October, 2021. There was also a thematic issue on insulin published by the Lancet, which as you know, is one of the major global you know, medical journals. And this was published in November, 2021. And I would encourage as many people as have access to try to get a copy of the book by Michael Bliss called The Discovery of Insulin. This was published in the year uh, 2007. It's an encouraging read. So first of all, for the benefit of those who might not be very medical, what is diabetes? What's the big deal about diabetes? Uh, now, the simplest definition is that diabetes is a metabolic disease, a disease that has to do with our acquisition and utilization of energy, foodstuffs, what we eat, how our body processes it. And uh, it is characterized by increased blood and urine levels of sugar. So the level of sugar in the blood increases and it gets spilled into the urine. In the simplest possible terms, diabetes develops as a result of inadequate amounts of insulin and inadequate action of insulin. But we are interested in it as physicians because of the multiple organ complications that develop over time with diabetes. This will affect the eyes, the heart, the kidneys, the legs, and so on. But one of my earliest experiences as a diabetes practitioner in Nigeria was the huge burden of leg amputations that diabetic patients had. It was really distressing. Now, how do diabetic patients present? Classically, they present with the symptoms of urinating a lot, waking up in the middle of the night to urinate. And as a result of that, they are also incredibly thirsty a lot of the time. Uh, despite the fact that they tend to eat a lot, they are losing weight. And their urine is sweet. In fact, the past diagnosis of diabetes was made by tasting urine. All right, and uh, even up to now in the villages, you can make a crude diagnosis if an individual just urinates somewhere in the yard because that urine is gonna be crowded by ants. So the next question is, what is insulin? Where is it produced? The insulin is produced by a group of cells called the islets that are present in the pancreas of the body. The, the pancreas is an organ that sits in the abdomen towards the back. Classically, the pancreas produces digestive enzymes, okay, and that's important for how we make use of the food that we're taking, all right, but it also has cells that produce different hormones. From our perspective, and so that you get the terminology that we're going to use, there are two main types of diabetes. There is the type 1 diabetes, which is more usually seen in children, and the older name was actually juvenile onset diabetes where the beta cells in the pancreas are totally destroyed. And so the pancreas is not making any insulin at all, which means in effect that they are going to require insulin for treatment. This affects children mainly and is seen in about 10% of cases. The more common one, which is seen in adults and called the adult onset or maturity onset diabetes affects older people about 80 to 90% of cases commoner in adults and it's associated with now resistance to the action of insulin. So the body produces insulin, but for some reason, it's not responsive to the insulin that it's producing. So that's commoner, but that is not to say that type two patients also do not need insulin for treatment because in a general sense, Patients may develop any type of diabetes and all its complications at any age. And patients with any form of diabetes may require insulin treatment at some stage of their disease. So that is what we know for certain. So uh, what's the big deal again about diabetes? 
it is a global problem. And the distressing thing about it is that it hits the poorest of the world the hardest. Okay, because over three in four people with diabetes actually live in low and middle income countries, including our dear country. If you look at this cartoon on diabetes around the world, you will see that in Africa, we've got 24 million people with diabetes, and that is probably an underestimate. In Western Pacific, they have the largest numbers of up to 206 million. In North America, it's about 51 million people. And about 10% of this population require insulin daily. And the larger number, which is the type 2, two patients may eventually require insulin. Again, how high are the stakes? If we look at it in the global dimension, about 550 million adults worldwide have diabetes. So that means one in 10 people around the world have diabetes. This becomes even more interesting when you know that about the same number have what we call pre-diabetes. Uh, and are at increased risk of developing diabetes. So that the diabetes paradigm affects about a billion people. Well, that's about one in five, one in six people. That these numbers could close to double in about 30, 40 years. And as I mentioned, about three in four adults with diabetes live in low and middle income countries, including Nigeria. In the year 2021, there were about 7 million deaths from diabetes, which means one every five seconds. That is a big deal. If we now bring it to Africa, and as you know, our statistics in Africa may not be very, very uh, uh, correct. We know that for now, from the estimates of the International Diabetes Federation, all right, about 24 million adults live with that. But we also know that over one in two adults in Africa with diabetes are undiagnosed, which means that as an estimate, we've got about 50 million people living with diabetes in Africa. And this number is predicted to double Diabetes caused over 400,000 deaths in Africa in 2021. And what is perhaps even more distressing is that diabetes in pregnancy is seen in a huge number of pregnant women. And this results in a number of deaths in that population. So to our story of today, I want us to just take a retrospective of insulin's 100 years, okay? And as you can see in the chart that's in front of you right now, diabetes was recognized perhaps in prehistoric times, all right? But it was about towards the end of the 19th century where the gentleman called Langehans described the pancreatic islets. And early in the 20th century, diabetes was linked to damage to the pancreatic islets. And some other workers, Minkowski, von Merin, and Hayden, actually induced diabetes by removing pancreases of dogs. Subsequently, before the 1920s, pancreatic extracts were prepared by ligation of the pancreatic dogs, all right, and used variously to try to control diabetes with minimal success. Perhaps a little success was made by Polesco, a Romanian, all right, uh, just before Bantin and Bess came into the picture. And they were able to decrease blood glucose levels in the pancreatized and normal dogs, but their extract was not pure. And there was a lot of problem with it. So into the picture came Bantin and Best. And that's a very, very interesting story, which will actually make our Nollywood very proud because it just exposed all the problems that we see with collaborative research. Banting was not a scientist, he was a surgeon. 
who got this idea that he could cure diabetes. Best was his was a medical student who was doing a summer capstone project. All right. Mark Leod was the scientist among them who was the chair of physiology at the University of Toronto and was approached by Banting with what looked like a crazy idea and turned out to be serendipitous. All right. Collip was a biochemist that was invited to join in the purification. I'm giving all this background so that you will know all the intrigues that happened around the discovery of insulin. Nonetheless, insulin was discovered, it was purified, and it was made available for clinical use. And surprisingly, the following year, these individuals were awarded the Nobel Prize, which was surprising because they did not even wait for this discovery to be proved over time. Apart from the Nobel Prize they got in 1923 for the discovery of insulin, there were a few other Nobel Prizes that came in relation to insulin. Fred Sanger discovered the insulin structure. And this was very important because as I will say later on, this set the stage for uh, recombinant DNA technology for uh, further refinement of insulin. Pallet got the Nobel Prize in 1974 for intracellular signaling. Uh, Roslyn Yalo, a chemist, got the Nobel Prize for the discovery of radioimmunoassay. And anybody in analytical biochemistry will know the importance of radioimmunoassay. Dorothy Hodgkin also got the Nobel Prize for using X-ray crystallography to discover the structure, three-dimensional structure of insulin. So apart from the Nobel Prize from insulin in itself, there were at least five other Nobel Prizes associated with insulin as a molecule. And that's why when I talk about an enduring legacy for science, I don't think any is bigger than insulin. So what happened if you got diabetes a hundred years ago? If you were older, death was as a result of infections and other complications. And I would expect that they did not see a lot of type 2 diabetes a hundred years ago because people were not living long enough, all right, and people were probably not fat enough, all right. What well, they were probably seeing a lot of was the juvenile type of diabetes, what we call type 1 today, all right. At that time, the life, the life expectancy after diagnosis was less than one year. I'm quoting from the Michael Bliss book. When they come to the hospital, they're emaciated, they're weak, they're dejected, with unquenchable thirst, dry skin, hard and harsh to the touch, like rough parchment, describing severe dehydration. And without treatment, they develop what we call acidosis, with a characteristic smell that sometimes pervaded the whole rooms or hospital wards. This is what we call diabetic ketoacidosis today. And then later on, because of this acidosis, they like gasp for hair. You know, what uh, our residents will know is Cosmo breathing. And if nothing was done about it, they quickly became drowsy, unconscious, and then died. And if you look at the pictures to the right, you can actually see this young guy three years before insulin. And look at the transformation in this guy two months after the guy started insulin treatment. It is dramatic. So the first report of the human treatment was actually published in the Canadian Medical Association Journal in 1922. And I've already given you some idea of the intrigues around the discovery of uh, insulin, where McLeod was the person who had the resources. He was head of department, so he gave the room and the dogs for the work to be done and did very little else. Banting was a surgeon who was not trained in research. So was just like, you know, beating about the bush. Best was a medical student looking for a capstone project to do. Okay, and was very, very instrumental to what was done with dogs, with Banting. Collip was brought in later on, you know, to purify the insulin. 
the ethical problem was this. When the Nobel Prize was given, it was given to McLeod and Banting, and Best was excluded. Okay, and then if you read the story, Banting was really very annoyed because he then decided to share his Nobel Prize with Best. McLeod also shared his with Colin. And the lesson for those of us who are senior and are heads of departments or chairmen of institutions is, what is the role of a chair of a department? I mean, is it, is it not his job to provide resources for his juniors who want to get research done? Should he get credit for the work that is done, even if he did not actively participate in it? So those are important ethical problems, which I'm sure those of us who are fairly senior, you know, uh, deal with on a daily basis. But I think publication, uh, major journals now insist that if you are going to be listed on a publication, you should show evidence of active participation in the research work that was done. As I said, you know, these guys at the end of the day were hardly talking to each other. All right, there was so much bad blood among them that McLeod had to resign and go back to Scotland. All right, Banting wanted credit, but did not get anything much after that. Best got a lot done, he was much younger, but the one who probably got the most credit and the most work done after insulin was discovered was Colin because uh, us endocrinologists know that colic was also important in the discovery of ACTH, TSH, and some other hormones. Later on, when insulin was to be purified, other important individuals like John Obel and David Scott were useful or important in the crystallization of the earlier versions of insulin. And the characteristic picture that you see of the discovery of insulin is actually that of Banting and Best here and their dog Marjorie, who was the first recipient of the crude extracts of insulin, okay, and lived for three months after insulin was given to. So this is really one of the pictures that I hope will be in the museum that the NAS will set up in future. The first individual to get insulin was a gentleman called Leonard Thompson. Okay, and uh, you know, without exaggeration, it was actually from a death sentence to resurrection because he was age 14 and at that time was just 30 kilos. One would expect him to be about 50 kilos at that age. So he was just skin and bones, pale, hair falling out, you know, malnourished, breath smelling of acetone, dull and listless, waiting to die. Before insulin, the treatment for diabetes was starvation treatment. They were just not giving them any calories. They were denying them food. So for an individual should be taking maybe about 1,500 calories a day, these individuals were given just about 450 calories a day. So they just sort of wasted and melted away. All right, so after the extraction was done. The crude extract was given in January 1922 to Leonard Thompson. Unfortunately, it did not work very well and resulted in some reaction and infection. And that was why Colip did some more purification. They gave a new extract. And as you will see in the chart, it was very effective in driving down the blood and urine sugars and immediately the boy became brighter, was more active, he looked better and said he felt stronger. This is Epochal. So after that, some other ethical issues. University of Toronto had the Connaught Laboratories, all right, that was producing antitoxins, right? So they were able to join Banting and Best and Colip and McLeod in further purification of insulin. Meanwhile, word was getting around the world that there was a magic drug that was coming out of Toronto. And this was how Eli Lilly and company got involved. Now one of the major global marketers for insulin. 
Also about the time, the Danes became aware of it and became interested about the insulin. And this was how Novo Nordisk became involved in insulin production. Eli Lilly and Novo Nordisk are two of the global monopolies for insulin production. But probably more important for us is that Banting, Best, and Collie could have become multi-millionaires from this discovery of insulin, but they decided to sell their patent rights to the University of Toronto for just $1 each. So they said that insulin belongs to the world and not to me. Again, a big lesson in bioethics. So animal insulins became the order of the day. Now they were producing gallons of insulin from pancreases derived from uh, cows and also from pigs. But the question that arose is that you can't keep giving this soluble insulin too frequently because as you know, insulin has a short half-life. You got to delay its action a little bit. And this was how these delayed action animal insulins came in. And these were the ones that were available for you know, longer term, you know, diabetic control in patients up till about the 1950s. A, a prototype of that is the NPH insulin, which is neutral protein hydrogen produced by Novo Nordisk. Now you can slow the onset of insulin and give it for a longer duration. So patients did not have to wake up every 30 minutes to get an insulin injection. So I allowed them to sleep. But then the fact is that you couldn't give it just as a single daily injection. And then there was variability in its absorption. So uh, although it was prolonging life, it was not yet the answer. And that was when the game changer now came in. The game, the game changer came in in the 1980s with the development of recombinant human insulin from recombinant DNA technology. Because by that time, insulin structure had been discovered, it, it had been sequenced, and it had been cloned. And so it could be transfected into bacteria, E. coli, or into yeast. And so by 1980, we had the first biosynthetic recombinant human insulin. It was also brilliant because this was now human insulin not bovine or porcine insulin, okay? So, and the rationale for this game changer was that there was this growing demand for insulin and limited supply of animals, cows and pigs, all right? And then if you gave an animal insulin to a human, you produce anti-insulin antibodies. And at the end of the day, this will cause a resistance to the insulin that you are giving. Unlike if you give human insulin, then you're not going to produce antibodies. And then there was also religious and cultural resistance. There are some parts of the world where they don't want anything to do with beef. And there are also some parts of the world that there was resistance to uh, derivatives from pork. So, but with this human insulin, you could go beyond those issues. In the sense now that you can produce gallons and gallons of insulin, you can concentrate it. It's now less immunogenic and will produce less leak of insulin resistance. It also said the Sorry, stage, we're, sorry to interrupt you, sir. Yes. We are, we are about out of time. Don't mind, sir. So I don't know how quickly you can try to wrap it up, sir. Sorry to interrupt you. Um, if I if I can have another five to ten minutes, uh, maybe three, sir. <laughs> we are way uh, over time, actually. <laughs> Thank you very much, sir. Okay, so um, so you had the insulin analogs that were developed and all that deriving from changes in the structure of this insulin. Okay, and since uh, Dr. Duban Jo has given me a deadline, I'm going to rush through this. So the insulin analogs now made insulin more available and was also going to be there for a longer period of time to have a smoother type of um, control. Regarding the 
biosimilars. I think Dr. Waifo is going to talk about that, so I will talk about that. And then this slide just shows you the different types of insulins that have been available. Also, in association with the availability of insulin is the development of insulin delivery systems. And I think Dr. Weifel will go into details of that. This slide gives the timeline of insulin over 100 years as a retrospective, most of what I've spoken about. So for the last two minutes, I just talk about the context now. All right, what does insulin mean for the world now? And this is captured in an editorial in The Lancet last year, which shows that despite 100 years of insulin, it's a technical success but an access failure in the sense that there are so many people who are not deriving the benefits from insulin. And then there's also inequity. Uh, it's racial in some parts of the world, but it's socioeconomic in our own country. Okay, and as you can see here, when you look at developing countries like ours, we are not deriving the benefits from insulin that some other developed countries have. Because if you don't get the insulin, you die. That's it. So if you don't have money, you die. That's the bottom line. So this is my own final take on this issue. Is insulin the answer or do we wait for another? And these are some of the issues that are you know, engaging me as a researcher. Diabetes is a cardiometabolic disease. People are dying from heart disease. In type two diabetes, we are giving patients very high peripheral insulin levels, and this is contributing to their cardiovascular disease risk. Also, as a person interested in signaling, I know that downstream signaling through, from the insulin receptor using the receptor tyrosine kinases predisposes patients to cancer. And then we also know that diabetes predisposes to COVID and that uh, predisposes to increased uh, morbidity and mortality from COVID. And I could go into the signal transduction pathways that are involved there. And when you look at people who die of COVID, a lot of them are obese, diabetic, hypertensive, and so on. And these are all related to insulin resistance. And we're actually treating symptoms rather than attacking the cause. So in summarizing all I've been saying here, I have just five bullet points that in the 100 years, diabetes has been transformed from a fatal disease into a chronic manageable condition. We've progressed from animal pancreases to recombinant DNA and lots of analogs that I did not have a lot of time to go into. We now have very many analogs of insulin as a result of amino acid modifications and use of molecular biology and protein chemistry. Now we have insulin replacement therapy that monitors the physiologic endogenous response. And we've laid the groundwork for a potential cure for diabetes. And so I'm gonna end with this uh, statement from the Endocrine Society that says, the future of insulin will that be a cure for diabetes. Impossible only means that you haven't found the solution yet. That the century old story of insulin which we are still writing has been a celebration of achieving the impossible. So happy 100th birthday insulin. I'm not gonna give you a chocolate cake. I'm gonna give you a basket of fruits because we are dealing with diabetes. And I thank everybody for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. And I know that was quite a rush to pack in all of that rich information. Uh, especially in the last few minutes, but we're indeed very grateful. I also hope that that definitely is the signal uh, that your slides can and will be shared with the participants to really uh, be able to catch up on some of the things you had to rush through. Thank you talk, very much. We'll talk about again, that sir. later. <laughs> we'll talk about that later. All right, sir. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Um, well, so I'm relieved and happy to have the actual moderator for this uh, meeting with us. And as I explained earlier, uh, he has indeed joined us. He's the, he's the past president of the Nigerian Academy of Science. Uh, that's Professor Gabriel Ogumola, FAS, and has uh, more than distinguished uh, to host this meeting. So far, thank you very much uh, for resolving the issues eventually. Happy to see you and to hand over to you. Thank you, sir. 
Thank you, Doi. I hope I've been unmuted. Yes, can you are. We can hear you loud and clear. Okay. Um, thank you very much. It's uh, technical problems from here. But, um, but um, I'd like to thank you for uh, starting up and making sure that uh, uh, this is a celebration. I joined the, um, the president. Uh, revered Professor uh, Ekanin Braid, FAS, um, in welcoming all of us to this Nigerian centenary celebration of a molecule history, a protein of unique value in human health. We've listened to uh, Professor Akonji presenting to us this excellent history. And, but I want to divert, I want to bring our attention to the fact that this, it is a discovery of the result of painstaking work of science and as application in medicine. It's translational activities of science to application in the management of diabetes. This is what has made insulin molecule such a wonderful and beautiful molecule worthy of celebration. The whole world is celebrating it. And Nigeria, with the scientific community, is glad to join in the celebration. And we've listened to uh, Professor Akonji. And I will also now just bring in the other um, participants and pan panelists uh, to continue. Uh, in this. Why this is significant to us is that all the panelists are themselves involved in this earth-shaking movement that has made insulin so useful. So they are themselves contributors into this centenary uh, event. And this molecule has the Professor Akonji had mentioned, has become a human heritage. It is significant that it is, it is a chemical. It is a protein. And a privilege for me as a chemist, a protein chemist, to moderate the achievement that have been made over this century year. The insulin is being discussed. The structure has been determined by chemists. Sanga had been mentioned. And those who have won the Nobel Prize in this area. And we are taking this as a challenge. Nigerian Academy of Science is showing case in this of how to go from basic science into application in solving human needs. So I will now call on uh, Dr. Kuku. Uh, to present the diabetes in the Nigerian context, burden of management and policies. And I would like to present that Dr. Sonny Kuku is a, round, is a renowned experimental and clinical endocrinologist who has done pioneering and seminar work on endocrine infertility in Africans and the betogenic effect of the various molecular forms of glucagon. He's the current chairman of the Board of Trustees of the Academy of Medical Specialists of Nigeria. And I hope that they will get chartered very soon by the National Academy. It's, he's the past president of the West African College of Physicians and the master of the American College of Physicians, a member of the American College of Physicians. Is a honorary life president of the Endocrine and Metabolism Society of Nigeria, the honorary life patron of the Diabetic Society of Nigeria, and the past president of Pan American Diabetics Study Group. We're so pleased and delighted to have such an eminent person continue in giving us uh, a treat on this centenary celebration. 
Dr. Kuku. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, the distinguished molecular biologist and um, the president, panelists, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it is a thing of honor for me to be here today to discuss the hormone insulin, particularly hundreds of years of it. And then uh, we, uh, there are a number of people that we need to mention here uh, who are molecular biologists who are not being celebrated as much as they should be. Professor Ade Igegrilo was uh, one of the first persons to discuss, to, to, to do, to really extract insulin from the pancreas as an anatomist in Nigeria. Uh, also, Professor Edozian, who is now the Asagba of Asagba, in chemical pathology in Ibadan, set up the first um, immunoassay for insulin uh, in his lab. And I think Professor Akonji must have benefited from that. And uh, in Lagos, uh, most of our research we started with was the measurement of insulin, glucagon, and uh, and growth hormone because they are all interrelated. In fact, you put insulin on one side, you put glucagon and all the others on the other side. And uh, it's, it, it is interesting that glucagon, like polypeptide, particularly the DDL one, is now being uh, is now being uh, used uh, the agonists to treat that tubal diabetes. So insulin is going along way. Can I have the first slide, please? Yeah. Now we start, and um, this is where we're going to go through. This is our journey for today, the history of diabetes and so on. And it's all listed there. And uh, we'll end by looking at policies and so on. Because really, Nigeria is really virgin in terms of uh, insulin management, insulin research, uh, just bend it. Um, we are at, uh, in, in our infancy. Although we've been where diabetes has been with us forever, like any other, any other disease. Um, next slide, please. Uh, I, I, uh, Professor Kwaji has done fantastic work describing uh, the history of uh, diabetes. All I can summarize is that uh, uh, diabetes has been there forever and has been the top subject of this, uh, discussion by philosophers, scholars, scientists, and so on. The discovery and the romance around insulin and all the intrigues uh, been well discussed by uh, again by uh, Professor Akonji. But uh, I'll, I'll now start from where it's, it, it becomes very interesting. Because as far back as 19, 1901, Albert Cook in his, um, in his treatise actually said that um, there was no diabetes in Africa. And I, I suspect he could have been right in many ways. That would have been, but it was so right. Because at that time, uh, like we all know, the Western influence has not taken over in Africa like it's done now. You can compare with the Pima Indians in, in America who had almost zero diabetes, but are now doing 60%. Uh, so, but, um, Papers on this have been uh, 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 very rare until uh, in the 60s and, and, and further on, when uh, Green and Kinnear and then our own uh, late and revered Mr. Kulashitoku 
and uh, Professor Thomas Johnson and Professor W. B. all pioneers in in, in, uh, in the history, study, art, and science of diabetes, and they they actually have said, and if you read Ashutoku's uh, paper, which was really a seminal paper, that um, diabetes was virtually non-existent, but I mean one percent in the population, two percent at the most. Uh, next one, please. Sorry, I'm not sharing this myself. Uh, can we go, uh, bless it, can we go to the next one? Aha, thank you. So, but things have changed. And um, right now, um, figures are now being bandied around to 5%, depending on where you are and who is doing the study. And whether you are looking at rural Nigeria um, or, or urban Nigeria, and also the social economic status of uh, the Nigerians. But whatever it is, it's already taken a big toll uh, on Nigerians. And I'll go into more details about that. Um, is the commonest cause of lower limb amputation in Nigeria. At one time, it was second to road traffic accidents, but now it has taken over. Uh, also, chronic uh, renal disease, heart attacks, strokes, and blindness. As in Nigeria, uh, diabetes is probably now uh, the, the foremost cause of it, particularly, like we know later. Diabetes comes with comorbidities, like probably with hypertension and other matters like that. Uh, and next, uh, next slide, please. Good, thank you. And um, in a, a lot of work is being done now in the last few years, and I'll just pick up a few things that are relevant uh, to, to let us know what the body is like in Nigeria. And then um, we, we now know that the predictive age, uh, uh, predictive factors include age, alcohol intake, and large amounts of alcohol, and then family history, and so on. And then uh, uh, Dr. Bera and myself studied um, the, the effect of infections in the criminals, and we found that uh, at least 12%, about 12% of tuberculosis patients do have diabetes colitis. And um, this has been corroborated by other workers. And one area that uh, we need to look at, that people don't really look at, is the association of diabetes and thyroid disease. But only like uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the primary, uh, hyper, uh, I mean, primary thyroid uh, hypothyroidism. And, uh, and then the war, that is the Stella Adedemo, the famous Amelio Adedemo. Actually, did this for her, she, her, her, her two thesis. And um, her father was also a very distinguished endocrinologist who worked in this field, particularly in, in terms of metabolism uh, and insulin. And she, her paper is a seminar paper on diabetes and thyroid in Nigeria. So, she found at least 10, about 10% of diabetics do have some form of hypothyroidism. And also, it's not surprising. And uh, Professor Fasomade and Professor Vera and Co. Professor Fasomade is now the president of the Endocrine Society of Nigeria. And they also found that since nine percent of women uh, in menopause. or heart metabolic syndrome. And as you know, as Professor Akonji has said, I shown very clearly, the, metab uh, the metabolic syndrome is a, is, uh, a combination of uh, insulin resistance, hypertension, cardiac disease, and type 2 diabetes. And uh, a lot of screening exercises have taken place. And amazingly, many of them have turned up very high figures. 
like in Osu State, uh, where they found a um, prevalence of uh, almost 17 percent, and uh, that, that study is still looked at, looked at, looked at in, in other ways now. And next one, please. Now, um, I'm, I'm, I'm putting up together to let us know what diabetes is like in Nigeria and where it is. And um, it's amazing that 77% um, of those who are placed on insulin only adhere to taking the insulin. But uh, clearly, the marker of APA1C is better in those who are there. And um, uh, the same uh, has been found by other people. But um, it's amazing that many of them were on 10 to 20 units per day. And, uh, and many of them are type 1 diabetes. One thing that uh, we need to point out here is that the prevalence of type 1 diabetes in the developed world, world, amazingly, is in the region of 10%, some 5%, some 15%, which is quite high. And, but in Nigeria, the prevalence is in the region of 2%, at the highest point about 5%, which is probably why the uh, insulin people are not very uh, active in Nigeria, because and the, the numbers are nothing as compared to as in Europe. And of course, um, the diabetic patients are, are on what people used to be called for the pharmacy, but which is now the, the treatment and uh, the way it works. Because most diabetic patients, even in Nigeria, have comorbidities like hypertension. Next one, please. Um, this uh, shows very clearly uh, the state of diabetes control in Nigeria. And uh, a study by Sada et al. last year, published last year, showed that only about 20% are in good control. And um, at the best, if you could fare with it, um, we are not we are not doing a lot. Of people are in control. I will have advanced reasons for that uh, 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 later. Uh, but uh, using ABA one C is not very common. It's not it's not fully available in Nigeria. It's being used more often now, but we are still dealing with uh, blood sugars and. Doing testing. So, whatever it is, even with all those crew members, um, the control is, uh, people in gold control in Nigeria are not very high. Next one, please. Uh, as for uh, medications, uh, 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 don't be surprised that uh, in, uh, at the top of medications we still we are using, of course, metformin is the high, is the highest uh, 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 drug prescribed, followed by uh, 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 Both of these, of course, are drugs for type two diabetes. And um, like I said earlier on, um, the uh, the the, the, the the type 1 diabetes or people requiring insulin um, are, are few, particularly type 1 diabetes. And so um, only a small percentage of our diabetics are on insulin. But with a new trend whereby um, insulin is being introduced early into uncontrolled uh, diabetes. Uh, insulin is beginning to creep into the amamented um, uh, to the to the cupboards and the stores, uh, the free refrigerators of people who have it and uh, use it in Nigeria. 
Next one, please. Next. Well, uh, in terms of mortality, mortality and morbidity, uh, the, around the world, Professor Akwati has uh, uh, described them very beautifully. Um, but as it is now, um, the age adjusted privilege ratio for type 2 diabetes in Nigeria um, has increased from 2% to about 5.7%. And uh, the, uh, that has been properly discussed earlier. And then the impaired glucose tolerance, uh, which is uh, defined very clearly as sugar between uh, uh, 5.5. Uh, at 5.6 and 7 is being seen in 10% of the population. Uh, uh, and if you, if you take 200 uh, million, we're talking about 10% uh, of that, which is uh, 20 million. That's a lot of impaired glucose transplant because you know the number of them then uh, go on to become diabetics. So, um, and this goes on with age. And we know that Nigerians are, uh, uh, Nigerian demography is very youth, is very uh, youthful, and we should be getting ready for the explosion and the effect of age on the prevalence. And if you remember the slide I showed earlier, age is a predisposing factor. But we also know that. Uh, the Western type life, life type diets, and, uh, and recreational drinks contribute a lot to prevalence of, uh, of uh, diabetes. The, the mortality rate uh, is about 30 percent per hundred hundred thousand, and that is documented in various studies. So we can. We can be talking about between uh, uh, between thirty and uh, twenty between twenty two and thirty in most places. We also have found that diabetes is becoming a, a, a major cause for admissions into a hospital. Please, can you next next slide, please? Good. In a uh, Lagos State University Teaching Hospital over an 11 year period, uh, it was shown that 10% uh, of all admissions were diabetes, uh, due to diabetes. And this is about what has been found in other centers across the country. And uh, in youth, um, it's almost the same. And so you can imagine. Uh, uh, the hospital having one in every 10 admissions of diabetes. And um, the reasons for that, for admissions were mainly hyperglycemic emergencies like uh, uh, the uh, 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 ketosis and so on. They, are, they were also admitted because of comorbidities like hypertension. And uh, the most common causes of death were diabetic foot ulcers, CVA, uh, and uh, even and the ketoacidosis, the hyperglycemic emergencies. And you can see those are things that in many places are treated, and I'm talking about also heart attacks in intensive care units uh, for good results. So you won't be surprised that I saw the death rate is so high. The fatality rate is so high when they are admitted. Next slide, please. The, of course, the greater complications of uh, diabetes will expect to be around because uh, of the poor control. And we know that the tighter the control of diabetes, the, the longer we can postpone the complications. So, from what we, we can see around in Nigeria, about half of people with type 2 diabetes have micro 
vascular complications with diabetic neuropathy being the commonest. Almost 70% of them have that. And sometimes it even relates the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the diagnosis of diabetes. It's followed by nephropathy, and diabetes is quickly becoming the top, the commonest cause of chronic renal disease. And you know the burden of that on, on an economy that does not have the facilities or the resources. And with no person, it's being seen in about 50%. And uh, diabetes is now slowly becoming the commonest cause of blindness in Nigeria. Next one, please. Now, uh, um, Dr. Kuku, um, yeah. just try to wind up so that we don't exceed the. Hmm? Oh, okay. Uh, okay. I'm getting very close to the end. Um, Thank you. Unfortunately, I think you are giving me only 15 minutes. Okay. Let, let's move, let's move faster. The, the cost of treatment of diabetes in Nigeria is at averaging about 50, 56%, 56,000. But with it, what has that happened is that with the, with the foreign exchange that has gone through the roof, it's closer to 100,000 100, now. So you can see the problems that diabetes is causing in Nigeria, among, other than amongst poor people. Next one, please. Next one. And then, how do they pay? Most of them pay out of pocket. And you can imagine the, 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 the problems that causes. Next one, please. And then the, the, the health insurance, which is commonplace in, in, the, in the United States and Europe and in other countries, where then to a point where, where only about 15% of the people who come for treatment are paid for by health by uh, by health insurance. So we have a problem. We have a problem in India, and that should be there is a problem. There must be a policy where the, the, so somebody must take care of the diabetics. Otherwise, we are going to have an epidemic of diabetic deaths. Please go on. Next one. Uh, the insulin, like I said before, uh, it's only about two to five percent of our diabetics that have on insulin. And most of them they use twice a day insulin. And a few of them use once a day. But only very few people will go for the tight control using four, four times a day. Next one. Next. The insulin usage in Nigeria, we have problems. The, the, Patients run away from it because of hypoglycemia and because of costs. And the physicians, of course, are very worried about weight problems and costs and skin problems. Please go on. Next one. Next one. So, um, most people in Nigeria, most diabetics in Nigeria use pre mixed insulin. And most patients have been told to put them in um, refrigerators. Of course, there are some insulin that can be put in room temperature, but my general room temperature can go very high, they get destroyed. Um, and most patients take twice a day. Next one. Next one. Yes. Uh, there's been policy uh, on non communicable diseases in Nigeria. It's on the website of uh, uh, World Diabetes Federation. And uh, serious steps have been taken to contain diabetes and to provide treatment. Next one, please. Next. Next. There are methods now being put down for uh, control of diabetes. One of them is the syntax, uh, which has been in developed countries for a long time. And last year, uh, we were uh, the lobby we were, we were able to. to Convince the, parla the parliament and the president to sign the sugar tax. But I can tell you it is being resisted 
by the manufacturers of, of uh, sugary beverages. And um, it's going to be a big problem. It's a big problem enforcing this uh, matter. But this is one of the ways to control it, to reduce, to make it ex so expensive that people don't buy these things. Next one, please. Next one, thank you. There are many NGOs and uh, civil society organizations that are now uh, looking at uh, diabetes and how to, to help in Nigeria. Next one, please. Next, next, the next one again. And I've, I've, talked, about, I've talked about comorbidities. And this is uh, glycemic control. Uh, in Nigeria, we're averaging more like eight point something, more than seven point something I should be. Uh, of eight day ones. Next slide. Next one. Next one. The next one. Actually, just go on. So the take home message is here is that uh, can you come back to last? Can you come back there? The, 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 the take home message is that diabetes is getting more prevalent in Nigeria, just like the happening in the world. The body is increasing. Most people are in bad control. And because of that, the uh, complications, uh, the very severe complications are creeping up on Nigeria. The economic body is going to become crazy. And then um, we need to work together with government and non government uh, organizations to try and stem the problem. Next one, thank you very much. The next one, thank you very much. Um, I, I, and the references for thank you and thank you to the academy. Thank you, Dr. Kuku. I mean, that's been most exciting and informative uh, uh, presentation. Uh, you're an authority, you're speaking directly to us on this, and I hope that uh, the take-home message is uh, one of the things that uh, we'll take to heart and try to implement. But I'm sure there will be many more participants who want to ask you questions during the question time. Thank you very much. I'd like to call on the third panelist, um, Dr. Wildfor. Dr. Wherefore is a board satisfying internist and endocrinologist with over three decades of clinical experience. He completed his undergraduate uh, medical training in Nigeria at the University of Ibadan. And I'm sure his father too was a professor of biochemistry at the University of Ibadan. So, and He's completed the general medicine residency uh, also at Ibadan. And um, he now at the University of Connecticut Health Center. He also completed a clinical and research endocrinology diabetes metabolism fellowship at the National Institute of Health in Bethesda. He's seen patients and he's done a lot of work. In addition, he experienced clinical researcher. He's a senior clinical scientist at the Medical Center Department of Endocrinology and Metabolism and the John Riddish Diabetes Institute. He's going to be telling us what we should look for in the next 100 years. That should be important to us. Dr. Waifo. I hope I have you online. Insulin, yes. the Are next you? 100 years. OK. Um, thank you. Welcome. Welcome, Dr. Waifo. Thank you, sir. Uh, and of course, we'll be at the same name, Gabriel. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, many thanks to 
Professor Gumola. Thanks to Dr. Mudubanjo, um, to Professor Braid, to my fellow panelists, and to everyone joining virtually from all over the world. Um, I have been tasked with looking into the crystal ball and giving some perspective about where things may be headed as regards insulin um, over the next 100 years. I will preface my, my comments by saying it is an extensive topic. Um, so I will go for breath rather than death. Um, fortunately, my slides will be available to be shared so that interested parties can look into a little more detail um, regarding some of the, the things I will touch on. Um, um, my disclosure statement essentially um, I like the fact that I'm involved in several clinical trials, um, but none of what I'm going to be presenting has any uh, conflict of interest that are relevant. Now I'm going to, like I said, I'll go with 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 um, breath here. So. In the next 25 minutes or so, I'm going to try and touch a little bit on the question of insulin and the prospects of cure of diabetes. I will talk about the future of insulin delivery systems, the future of biosimilar hybrid and what we call co-peptide insulin, the future of automated insulin delivery systems, especially pumps, the future of prandial and basal insulin, the future of inhaled insulin. I will spend some time on oral insulin. Um, because I think that's where the future will really um, probably have some focal jump. And then um, I will close with a few comments about insulin delivery systems as regards islet transplant. And finally, talk um, a little bit about some things that Professor Akonji had already mentioned regarding the future of insulin as a mirror of society before concluding. So, Professor Akonji gave us a of uh, man's uh, perspective of the journey of insulin from um, the 1600 through the 19th century, the 20th century, and to where we are now, where we have so many different products compared to where we started from this single um, vial um, first prepared by college. We have so many options now. Um, and the question is, with all this, what comes next? One of the big um, questions that has been raised in some quarters is whether or not um, insulin as a whole um, in a hundred years will have any relevance. Some people have the opinion that, oh, by then diabetes will be killed. Um, won't insulin be a relic of history by that time? I will submit to you that that's unlikely. And um, I say that because to start with, it all depends on what you mean by cure. Um, if you are to use the infectious disease model, um, the likelihood that we will have insulin and diabetes cured in the next 100 years is very small. What may not be I'm projecting clearly is a whole list of the various types of diabetes that we now know they are present. There are over 50 different varieties and um, iterations of diabetes. And so it's important to remember that diabetes is not one disease. It's a, it's a syndrome complex with a multiplicity of etiology. And to think um, that we will have a cure for diabetes that covers everything, it will be as simplistic as thinking, oh, we'll have a cure for cancer. Now, let's remember that soon after the discovery of insulin, it was touted as a cure itself. We are 100 years later and um, clearly we still have some ways to go. So um, I do think diabetes will, will be available. It will be present. It will be an issue even 100 years from now. And as long as diabetes remains a mirror of socioeconomic measures and indices, um, it is unlikely to be eradicated in the strict sense. That being said, it's important to also be aware of the concepts of diabetes reversion, which we are seeing more and more of. 
the concept of diabetes remission. Um, that is a situation where you can achieve A1C values of less than 6.5 for extended periods of time in the absence of any medication therapy. And that should be distinguished from the true concept of cure, which we see very rarely. And, um, and, and that may still be the situation in 100 years from now. Now, let's talk very quickly about the future of automated insulin delivery system, um, talking about pumps. Now, for patients with exclusive type 1 diabetes, the fully automated insulin pump is seen by many as the most proximate cure that we can uh, anticipate for this condition. And it's important to be aware of what the elements are that are required to be able to have a pump, so to speak, as a veritable cure for diabetes. Now, it would require a continuous serum glucose sensory input. It would require continuous real-time serum insulin delivery that is responsive to the glucose inputs. Um, it would require the capacity for real-time adjustment through the entire glycemic spectrum, from hypoglycemia to hyperglycemia and normal glycemia. And it would require the capacity to interact in real time with other related pancreatic and insulin related hormones. It would also require the capacity to respond to physiologic and demographic changes, such as caloric intake, physical activity levels, stress, illness, weight gain, um, puberty in children, pregnancy in women, breastfeeding, et cetera. So it's a lot to unpack it. Um, but as complex as it sounds, um, we have come a very long way we have continuous glucose sensing systems. We have capacity to deliver insulin subcutaneously quite effectively. And there are various algorithms that have been developed to allow the two talk together. So at this point, the only real remaining hurdle to overcome the dawn of the true closed loop is the fine, fine, fine development of sufficiently sophisticated interactive and intelligent algorithms that can rapidly and effectively link continuous glucose monitoring systems to continuous insulin delivery. That being said, what we call hybrid pumps are already available. They are pumps that are able to deliver insulin on, in a continuous fashion and only require the patient to put in some information at the time of need. So this is very close to becoming available. Um, there are patients who are also beta testing so-called true insulin smart pumps. So it would not surprise me if um, in our lifetime, definitely not up to 100 years from now, we will have um, fully automated insulin pumps. The question though is that it probably will not stop at that. Already we have some um, trials, one of which I've put here from um, the Canadian Medical um, Journal using multi-chamber pumps where it's not just insulin that is being delivered, but some of the other hormones that are produced by the islets of Langer. So, and some of the other hormones produced by the bowel. So there are multi-chamber pumps already tried and in trial using GLP, uh, glucagon-like peptide one, glucagon, or similarly as co-administrators with insulin. And um, smarter pumps that, have, that are using better algorithms to closely fine tune the delivery of these various hormones are in early stages of development. Furthermore, there are some pumps that use an osmotic delivery system. One of these is very close to our approval now, the ITCA 650 mini pump from Intersia. And this uses a subcutaneously implanted pump that has already been used and reported to deliver other hormones like um, extending for another GLP analog. So this is another means by which insulin and insulin um, associated peptides will probably be delivered in the near future. Now, the other point to make is that one of the biggest problems we have with insulin pumps is the way we give insulin right now, which is subcutaneous. And I'm going to mention a little bit of this more a little later. But by giving insulin by a subcutaneous route, 
you have to give larger amounts. You have to essentially deal with the hepatic first pass effect subsequently. And that has been one of the major struggles with insulin pumps. One of the solutions to that is actually revisiting an old technology. Um, this is the old mini med picture of the old mini med peritoneal pump. I was privileged to be involved with um, um, the clinical trials of this product years ago. And what was striking was that the patients who used this, um, I had three of them, had some of the best diabetes control you can imagine. And, and it's now presumed that that is probably because by delivering the insulin intraperitoneally, the insulin reaches the um, acts on the liver and the pancreas um, initially before getting into the systemic circulation. And so that the amount of insulin required um, is far lower. Now, this device was discontinued because of the need to have to do surgery to implant the device. And Minimed did not feel that this had long-term commercial utility. But as these two papers show, this has been revisited because of technology that came from peritoneal dialysis. There are these port devices now that are now implanted onto the skin of the abdomen. And through those port devices, you can use a pump to deliver insulin peritoneally. So it would not surprise me. I actually anticipate that the way we use the, the nature of insulin pump will very likely change in the near future rather than subcutaneous insulin delivery, that peritoneal delivery through the systems like this, um, or some systems that are actually implanted, much the way we have implanted defibrillators and implanted pacemakers, will probably be the wave of the future. Um, so just to round up on insulin pumps, we've come a long way from when insulin pumps were initially like a big backpack at the back, to where we are now, where they are, we have a lot of platforms, and I anticipate that eventually, within the next 100 years, the vast majority of pumps, you will probably not be able to see the, see the pump on the first it will be internalized, it will probably be delivered by peritoneal means. Now, let's talk a little bit about biosimilar hybrid and co-peptide insulins. Um, the ultra-fast subcutaneous insulin, we already have analogs. Um, and Professor Akonji has talked about um, the, the whole process of changing the nature just by altering a few amino acids to improve the bioavailability of insulin. Well, we have FIAST, um, an ultra-fast form of Novolog developed by Novonordis. We have a new ultra-fast Humolog product called Lumgev, developed by Eli Lee. There is another product by Biodel called Insulin Biogen, and there's another one called Halozyme. Um, all, these, all these tech tell about technology to increase the bioavailability and the speed at which insulin becomes available for short acting insulin. But it does underlie the problem of giving insulin subcutaneously. Insulin Corporation has developed a system by which their insulin is delivered using a warming patch. And these little cartoon here shows the impact of using the warming patch and the way it improves the initial delivery of virtually any insulin product, short acting insulin product, whether it's blue lysine, lyspro, or aspartame. So there will be, be more and more of this being developed as a means to try and get subcutaneous insulin delivered even faster than it is right now. And this slide talks about some of the technology related to that. I will not spend time here. Now, the same sort of technology is now being applied in the opposite direction for long acting insulin. So we have long acting insulin, the original being the, um, the neutral protamine hagedon that um, Professor Akonji had mentioned. But now, since the time of glagine, we've had even more longer acting insulin that are largely peakless and last for long periods of time. And these are two of the biggest ones. There's a pegylated lyspro developed by Lee, and that's its um, chemical acronym. And what they did here was to attach a polyethylene glycol moiety to the insulin so that its half-life is then prolonged to between 48 to 72 hours. Um, and insulin icodex 
So the initial reports of which were reported in the New England Journal just two years ago um, is a weekly basal insulin developed by Novo Nordisk. And they use a slightly different technology by oscillating the insulin analog and so increasing it to about 70 hours. And this results in tight but reversible serum um, albumin binding. And what that does is that it gives you the capacity to be able to give an insulin injection once a week, which is a huge deal as far as resources, resource management, and providing stability of control um, in between periods of meal-related glycemic spikes. So as far as the question of types of insulin, we know that there are ultra-slow and ultra-fast insulins that are being developed. This, this little cartoon details some of the ultra-slow and ultra-fast insulins that are in various stages of development. I won't spend too much time on them. The highlights I have already mentioned. As far as the spectrum of insulin analogs go, and this little cartoon shows the wide spectrum from the ultra rapid to the longer. One area that is an unaddressed need and niche, and this is a shout out to younger colleagues um, back in, um, at home in Nigeria and in other underdeveloped parts of the world. The huge need that is not being addressed is the need for ultra stable prandial and basally environmental stable insulin. One of the biggest issues with insulin is that because it's a peptide, um, you have to have it preserved in such indefinite temperature and humidity based settings. But that's not a given. The technology from molecular biology and clinical chemistry suggests that there are means by which this can be obviated. And um, this is an area of need um, to develop stable insulins that are heat and humidity resistant. So that having an insulin that can maintain efficacy and potency in the spectrum of harsh environmental and climate conditions, ranging from the tropics to the frozen tundra, would be huge. Um, the, need, the need is now for this sort of um, insulin um, option, and it would represent a huge potential leap in insulin technology for the future. And I suspect we will have this type of insulin. Um, somebody out there is going to come up with a way to do this. And it may, be, it may well be one of our colleagues um, reading and hearing about this. Now, let's talk about the so-called copeptide insulin. These are insulin preparations that are combined with other metabolically active peptides to improve the glycemic and metabolic efficacy of the molecule. There are already two, two um, examples of this available. So the precedent has already been set. There is a product from Novo Nordisk called Zitolfi that is a combination of insulin um, Deglodex and the GLP-1 analog, the Ragutan. And Sanofi have a product called Soliqua which is a combination of insulin glargine and the GLP-1 analog lixazenitide. And this is a trend that I anticipate will increase and continue. Um, the major candidate combinatorial insulins that are in various stages of development include combinations with other GLP-1 analogs, combinations with glucagon, combination with the um, beta cell-derived protein amylin and amylin analog, and in particular, there is a long-acting amylin analog called tagualinotide um, that is being developed on its own and in combination with certain insulin. And essentially, what these products try to do is to simulate in one molecule what the beta cell used to do in patients um, who, did, who, who had diabetes. And this, this cartoon describes what I just mentioned in more pictorial form, um, especially for patients with type 1, um, co-peptide insulins will probably be insulin and amylin um, co-peptide -co in some shape or form. For type 2s, it would probably be more insulin with GLP-1 or insulin with glucose. Now, other areas of innovation that are coming up are other means to, to uh, make insulin available 
um, by means that do not require injection. And this is one interesting um, prospect that was published um, in 2019 and will probably continue to be developed. The researchers used the so-called leopard tortoise, which is pictured here, and developed little insulin um, orally administered micro-injection devices. So for people who remember those toys that have a way of, the toy has a way of always staying upright. You can't keep it over, it goes back upright because its base is top heavy. It's the same principle. And these are the little micro, micro delivery system. They have a little insulin inside. And the principle is that these agents are taken by mouth. They have insulin in them, but then the insulin never gets deployed until the particle reaches the distal part of the stomach where it's a, there's a little horizontal um, anatomy. And at that point, when it takes a structure like this, then there's auto injection of the insulin. Furthermore, there's also development of what are called hepatopreferential insulins. These are insulins that are biologically designed to preferentially bind to the hepatocyte. By doing this, the insulin essentially targets hepatic glucose output and reduces that excessive glucose production from the liver that drives a significant part of fasting hyperglycemia. So there's, there's one in particular that's in um, early preclinical development called the hepatic derived vesicle insulin. And in this case, the insulin is contained in a phospholipid layer, um, a vesicle with biotin phosphatidyl ethanol amount. And by this sort of casing, it is granted specific hepatocyte binding specificity. Now, the next area to just make mention of are the so-called glucoresponsive insulin. They are sometimes um, abbreviated as GRI. These are insulins that are activated to initiate their glucose lowering effect only in the setting of hyperglycemia. So this addresses the big problem of having to be very careful how you time your insulin with your caloric intake to prevent hypoglycemia. They are sometimes colloquially called smart insulin. They are still in very early preclinical development stages, but this has considerable potential. And I, and I do suspect that within the next 100 years, a large variety, a large portion of the insulin share market will be GRI. That is insulins that they would only get activated and initiate their biologic action in the setting of hyperglycemia. There are at this point two broad based groups of GRI. There's a polymer based system, which is illustrated below, which have insulin encased in a glucose responsive polymeric vesicle or a hydrogel. So these are, this, these are combined, these are composed largely of glucose binding proteins like glucose oxidase or boronate based chemicals. The insulin is encased within that, and the insulin will only get released when there is ambient hyperglycemia. The second broad groups of this system are the, what they call the bioconjugates. Um, these deliver a glucose responsive motif. Again, boronic acid features um, prominent protein or manose, and these are then delivered um, to the insulin, and only when the two are present together um, um, proximally will the insulin get activated. So this is an area to keep an eye on as far as glucose responsive insulin as um, another area of technology that will very likely um, be the wave of the future. I will make a little mention about biosimilars um, because this is important for less fortunate, less less um, resource um, available countries. And this all stands out of what we call the patent cycle and the insulin war. And Professor Akondi had alluded to this. In here in the United States, there's this system by which the, the medications have, uh, the, the companies that get the medications have a patent period of about 12 years. During that period, they're exclusive. Um, they are the only ones who can market it, um, and they much can decide what they charge for. And this is part of what drives the cost of insulin, despite the fact that insulin is 
cheaper to produce now than it was in the time of banting and best. Um, and once that is done, the once the patent clears after that 12 years, technically other companies can get involved. And what has happened, for instance, right now, insulin gladin is still the most widely prescribed insulin in the world. It's made by um, made by by um, Novo Nordisk. And in an attempt to get a share of that, various other big players within the company, within the insulin sphere have developed products that are kind of similar to insulin gladin. There is um, a basic glad that was developed by, based, um, by uh, Eli Lidi. But to try and keep the patent rolling, the, oh, sorry, I'm sorry, insulin gladin is by Sanofi. To try and keep the patent going, Sanofi developed little changes to the original molecule. So they have a Tugeo, um, insulin, a Tugeo mask to try and keep exclusivity. Well, the FDA here in the United States finally decided that they have to start, they have to break this sort of cycle. And that is where the issue of biosimilars, which is almost like a generic alternative for protein biologics have come in. And the first biosimilar available for insulin is this product called, called Sembi. This is all important because these biosimilars are the protein equivalent to generics. And this is where from a, from a industry in um, less privileged countries, less wealthy countries can come in as a means to be able to provide protein products like insulin at significantly lower cost. Now, I do hope that the biosimilar quandary should be a relic of 60 or 100 years from now, but that will be entirely dependent on social constructs that are beyond all of our control. You mentioned about the future of inhaled insulin. There are pros and cons for inhaled insulin. The pros are that it's non-invasive, it's needle-free, relatively easy to administer. It has a rapid onset of action and it uses a high volume of distribution of the pulmonary or the lung airway. However, there are significant issues with bioavailability when patients have either acute or chronic respiratory things like asthma, things like a food can affect their bioavailability. There's also the question of the impact of bioavailability in people who smoke. And then there's the potential of insulin as a growth factor affecting insulin um, lung function. And that was shown very clearly with the first inhaled insulin called um, exuberant, which finally got pulled from the market. There is one inhaled insulin now on the market called a freezer. Um, and as you can see from this slide, a freezer has the, the fastest onset um, of all the rapid insulins available. So it has potential. The, the issue though is that it does not offer an option for basal insulin delivery. And as, as nice as it all sounds, the reality is that freezer is really hardly, hardly widely used. And I do not think this is going to change significantly in the future. There is new technology as far as inhaled insulin. There's this thing called a vibrating mesh that is being developed by a company called Jans 501. But I will conclude the issue of in inhaled insulin by saying that I may be wrong, but I doubt that inhaled insulin will be a big player in insulin and diabetes therapeutics in the 100 years from now. It just doesn't seem to have the market share that some of the other things that I've mentioned already do. Can you, can you kindly round up? Yes. Um, as far as the future of insulin delivery systems, um, ILS transplants and technology related to ILS transplants have considerable um, potential. I've mentioned here the use of our genetic coated ILS, immunologically new ILS, um, immunotolerant xeno ILS transplants using bioengineered pig ILS. And the big one um, for the future really is the use of 3D printed eyelet lattices, which are immunologically silent. Oral insulin is a big place that where technology is going for. Are, we already have several peptides, Ribelsos and Mikasa, that show that it is possible 
to give peptides orally. And it looks like oral insulin may well be the holy grail of diabetes therapeutics. This is a paper that describes an oral insulin um, framework in phase three trials using what are called nanoparticles that form almost like a sandwich in which the insulin is embedded. It's taken by mouth and then it passes through the bowel and in the setting of high type of, of, of glycemic load, the latest breaks down and the insulin is released. And these are three other oral insulin products Two of them, rapid acting, one, basal acting, that are in early areas of development as well. So the future of insulin as a mirror of society. And I ask, where can Nigeria make its mark in the insulin story and the narrative of diabetes therapeutics? And um, having listened very closely to what um, Dr. Fuku had, had um, to say regarding where we are now, I would point out that the Indian biopharmaceutical revolution provides an example of the way forward. Um, all of us here um, can probably remember where India was in the 1960s and 70s. Well, that has been significant. Uh, this slide shows the, the numbers as far as their um, revenue generation for biopharmaceuticals. And this, is, this has happened in the last 20 to 30 years. Um, I would submit that Nigeria can replicate this and aspire to be the dominant force in biopharma and healthcare delivery for the African continent. Um, it would just need the wheel um, from the decision makers to, to change the way we are doing things. Thank and you. Let me conclude by talking about um, the future of insulin as a mirror of society. Many of the issues that we still face now continue to be persistent. And the question we need to ponder is, in 100 years, what world will we live in? I, I go from um, popular TV shows to shows that offer very contrasting views of what the future can look, look like for us. Elysium is a story that talked about a future in which the world was dichotomous. Um, there was a, city, a, a whole town that was in the stratosphere called Elysium, where everything was available. Health, there was virtually no disease. Health care and all the advances were available. And then down on earth, it was European world. People were just living in poverty and want. As opposed to the future depicted by Sartre, where there is a more equitable um, availability of resources for everyone. This is the world in which hopefully we will have our descendants leave. So in conclusion, as I look at the proverbial crystal ball as to what will become of insulin 100 years from now, I expect that diabetes will remain a metabolic challenge, but we will likely have more cure patients and patients in cardiometabolic. I do expect that insulin will continue to play a role in the management of patients with diabetes but that standard injectable subcutaneous insulin will be far less commonly used. I think we are going to see far more of oral insulin. We're going to see pumps that cannot be seen by the naked eye. And I expect that the bionic pancreas will probably be the norm by then. The insulins of 21, 22 will be very likely different structurally from what we use now. I think that we will have um, hybrid insulin. We will have insulins that are tailored and designed to specific patients using what we call precision medicine. And I expect that at the bicentennial commemoration, so 200 years, practitioners will be back at our time with the same nostalgia, surprise, at how unsophisticated our present treatments were, and with the same historical interest that we view the times of Banton and death. I do hope that these advances will be accessible and available to people who have need of it, regardless of race, demographic, place of birth, Resident, social status, and financial needs. And these are my acknowledgments. Just like to mention my dad, um, who passed two years ago. My family, to my teachers, um, Professor Akonji, um, who taught me as a med student, who taught me as a resident, who taught me um, as a fellow when I spent time at UCH. Professor and to Dr. Kuku. Um, 
who was one of my chaperones during my residency. Um, and obviously to the good Lord. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That's it for your beautiful way of um, what we should look for. Well, the second message, I think, uh, before we open the, uh, the portal to everybody to ask questions, I think we'll let's ask for questions here and there, and then we'll get the um, panelists to respond to that. Probably the time is uh, exhausted about two hours right now. So I uh, will plead that people do not uh, repeat the questions or attempt to give us another. I think we've received three beautiful presentations, uh, which I think the, the academy is very grateful and the scientific community of this uh, country is quite grateful. I think one legacy we can leave from this lecture is to plead with you to write it up for the academy to become a public publication of the academy. I'm sure we'll negotiate this with the panelists uh, to be three lectures dedicated to this centenary uh, celebration and it will be published by the academy. I think I'm making that plea to you. I'm sorry, it's a little bit uh, another imposition on giving the lecture, but I think that you'll be glad that that will be a legacy. And the 100 years that you are looking forward to, there will be many more people who will read those lectures that you have given today. Uh, then from what uh, we have received from you, there is a need to build the scientific community. You refer to India and so on. And I think that we cannot leave it alone to the politicians now. I think the scientific community must engage those of you in the diaspora to work together to build the scientific institution that will meet our needs. I could, I could recognize talking about the pharmaceutical company. Without chemical companies, we cannot build a viable industry that will support the health. So it is high time that the dialogue and engagement between the scientists in the diaspora and those within the country, start working together to achieve some of the dreams and some of the data and aspiration that you have. Um, so we'll open now the question, uh, the portal so for people to ask questions and we'll take the questions together and the panelists will just respond to them. I hope we can do that within the next 10 minutes. Thank you very much. And I'm very proud of you. I mean, of course, uh, uh, I know you pretty well, and I'm quite pleased at your delivery. Well done. So we now ask for questions from the portal. Uh, as soon as I see them displayed, I will read it out, and um, I hope, uh, and if there are none, we we'll just close on the on the summaries. Um, actually, sir, um, there are questions already in the Q&A box. So maybe because of time, the panelists can please um, type in the answers to the questions at the same time, if possible, please. I can't hear you. I was saying that there are questions already in the Q&A box. OK, there are questions already. I can see them on the portal. If I can see them displayed, that will um, we'll display them to the uh, panelists to respond. You can read the questions out if um, you can't um, access them from your answer, if you, if you don't mind. Um, Professor Gumala, at the bottom of the screen, you know, you have uh, the many options, and one of them is Q and A. The other one is your voice uh, is uh, there is voice is very low. 
Oh, okay. Uh, is it better now? I said at the bottom of your screen, you're going to see some menu options. All right. And uh, so where you have the share screen, just before you get to share screen, you see the chart, you see the chart, and you also see the Q&A. So if you click on the Q&A, you're going to get the questions that have already been posted by people. I don't know whether you can see it. At the on the iPad is on the top. Or is it at the top? Maybe for some people, you know. But oh, you the, see... iPad, the iPad, yes, the iPad. Okay. So maybe at the top or the bottom, we are going to see those uh, options, and one of them is Q and A. If you click on it, and the uh, blessing can read them out, but there is one that I, I would like to speak to, and um, which has. Which is very interesting because the, uh, the attendee asked, since we cannot really have afford the cost of insulin and cost of treatment, would it be better to have advocacy and prevention? And I think it's a very beautiful question because in the uh, non communicable diseases, uh, and the global and Nigeria, the emphasis really now. And we cannot, of course, treatment is part of management. So that we still have to find a way to get insulin. But believe me, the um, just making people aware of these diseases and the, the, the problems associated with them and also the causative factors and the, and the factors that could lead to them would, would do a lot to reduce the prevalence. And um, in the uh, NCD Alliance, what we're doing is exactly that. In fact, what we're advocating and what is uh, uh, happening is that the primary health centers if a person goes there and says, I have been, I have been wounded uh, from uh, a male or I've had an accident, that person must have a screening tested and also has to have a blood pressure taken. In that case, we pick them up um, early and then we can introduce the treatment. So, so in fact, we are, we are, even in maternity centers, when people go, come there, both the child, mother, and so on. So prevention advocacy is a, it's really a pillar in the mindset of diabetes. But that doesn't remove the fact that those two percent of the population will still require insulin. And we must find a way to get the insulin to them cheap and if possible free. The same way. We must find a way to give them even the, uh, the oral drugs. Some of them are even more expensive than insulin. So I, I was I'm emphasizing that question. That it was a very, very, very important question. And the amount of insulin it will reduce dramatically. Thank you very much. Well, I want to come in here. If we really take that approach, then we must start a full-fledged primary health care, which starts literally from childhood, early childhood testing, um, lifestyle management, and things like that, before people get to the level of even needing insulin in their adult life. If I can, if I can also join in that conversation, Please. I think I, I align myself with the views of uh, Olorogukuku on the need for preventative measures. And uh, probably type 2 diabetes, as of what we know right now, is totally preventable because there's a significant association with, with obesity and lifetime choices. So if people don't get fat, all right, and uh, do a lot of physical activity and eat the right foods and so on and so forth, they typically 
should not get type 2 diabetes, okay, except they have a genetic predisposition. In any case, you still need the environment for it, you know, to, to so type 2 diabetes probably can be prevented to a large extent and with the cardiometabolic complications. But with type 1 diabetes, we don't really know enough about what is causing it right now. We know that a lot of it is autoimmune. We know that there is damage as a result of some antibodies or some specific proteins that the body is responsive to. But that I think is where the double whammy is because uh, with type one diabetes, you cannot do without insulin. If you don't take the insulin, you die. I mean, it's pure and simple. And so this is where I also think that uh, government has to come in you know, either through the National Health Insurance Scheme or some other, you know, measures. I know in the past, you know, uh, insulin was given free in hospitals by government. But now, you know, you got to pay for it. And these insulins are getting more and more expensive, particularly the analogs. So uh, there's the role of individual. There's also the role of government. But more importantly, we need appropriate policies from government to deal with this life-threatening chronic conditions. Thank you. Professor Eisenhower wants to talk. Can you come to the microphone? Is Professor Eisenhower responding? I've been sending mm -hmm. Professor Eisenhower wanting to express some can opinion. Can you hear me now? We can hear you, just go ahead. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for this opportunity. Mm -hmm. I think it's a very wonderful uh, section. And uh, mm -hmm. I want to get away from Ms. Hulin for a short while and to ask the presenters whether they can foresee, especially Dr. Waifu, any development in Nigeria that is going on at this moment that can be looked after, looked at. 100 years from now, the same way as we are looking at insulin. We're talking a lot about uh, advocacy and all that. Sickle cell disease, which is my area, happens to have a lot of advocates now, but it seems to me it's two steps forwards and one backwards, uh, or almost standing on the same step. Can anybody cast a crystal ball outside of diabetes or any, or any other disease? or substance that we have discovered in Nigeria that may be useful for the next 100 years. Thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you very much, sir. Um, I, my thoughts about this relate to, and it's interesting you mentioned sickle cell. Now, we all know that there, for the, for the traditional herbalists that have been involved in the healthcare system um, back home for years, for literally centuries before, before the advent and the ascendancy of, of traditional allopathic medicine. There is clearly some utility to certain products um, that have been used for sev several therapeutic uses. And I do wonder because here, here in the US, there is the national, they have the National Institute of Complementary and Alternative Medicine that acknowledges the fact that they, there is need to go into and carefully research the utility of so-called folk remedies to try and get a better understanding of what may be useful and efficacious. And I think we need something in that form and in that vein within Nigeria, a specific, well-organized system that carefully evaluates some of the older, older therapeutic herbs and um, diets and things to try and see what can be, what can be, um, can be, what can be gleaned from those systems because I suspect there is considerable utility that can be found there, but it needs to be carefully structured. That would be one way in which we can find resources that are um, 
specific that render managed will be less expensive to develop and take to the point of full-blown therapeutics. So that's one way, one area that I think needs further expansion and further development. The other, the other issue, and this is, and this is an, a, a whole theme, is, and I mentioned it as regards insulin, but it applies to virtually all of the biologics, is the concept of developing technologies that allow peptides to be administered as oral medication will be a huge one for um, tropical countries. Because then you, you no longer have to, to deal with all the vagaries of injection, all the vagaries of set, uh, septic technique to, to administer those injections, the resources for needles and so on. So that is another area that I think a lot of investment from as far as resources and training and investigation will be useful to spearhead development of resources to make oral preparations of peptides available. Well, thank you very much. I think I, um, I align with the question Professor Esmond is trying to raise. And I'm saying that the commitment has to come from all of us. I mean, we've left our country too much in the hand of those who are just leading us astray. Um, but I think that we should own our own country and try to get together, build, a, build appropriate institutions that can serve our needs. We know it's been tough, it's been hard, and, uh, but other peoples have done it for their own country. Take Israel, take the Germans, okay? If we continue, if we continue going by the leadership we have, I think the academic community itself has now to come together and regroup both at home and those abroad to say that this is a country we must rescue with our knowledge, intellect, and what God has given to us. Thank you. Any other question that uh, Blessing may want to read to us, if there is any? Okay, yes, sir. Yes. Um, someone asks um, that the burden of diabetes is increasing in Nigeria and the cost of treatment is also affecting adherence. Is it possible to find a role for natural products? Okay, go ahead. Um, there's another question. What is the prospect of adipose skin cell therapy? Um, Maybe I should read all of them so that they can go ahead. Yes, the panelists are noting them and they will just address all of them once. Let's okay. go ahead. Someone asks if it's possible to get diabetes from eating um, ripe fruits. <laughs> go ahead. Um, another question says, would you kindly comment on the involvement of corporate America, for example, the Kodak company in the development of insulin? And what lessons corporate Nigeria can learn from it? And Go ahead. Insulin administration error is one of the commonest medication errors. How can the pharma industry working with clinicians eliminate the risk of error? Okay. Um, find, um, one other one is um, what can be done to improve access to, um, to insulin? And um, should more emphasis to advocacy? Okay, I believe that has been answered already. And um, yes, yeah, one more question on the use of um, um, herbs and natural treatments. Those are all of them. Okay. Thank you. Can I just ask the panelists to... Uh... Just address each of this, uh, all these questions in two minutes each. Thank you. Starting with Dr. Uh, Professor Akonji. Yes, um, I, I think I will take the question on eating ripe fruits and the uh, role of herbs and natural treatments. Um, well, one, of the, one of the first lessons I learned as I've matured in diabetes management and research is that there is no absolute about diabetic nutrition. Okay, I mean, you cannot tell 
the illiterate woman who eats a bao amala every day that because a bao and amala have carbohydrates, they should not eat it. So the, the point that I'm trying to make is that things have to be done in adequate moderation. And people have to know the concept of counting calories, how much carbohydrate is there, how much fat is there, and how much, um, how much protein is there. And I know that teaching hospitals have good nutrition and health education uh, facilities for that. Maybe that needs to be ex extended to primary health care too, so that even illiterate people have an idea of what they can eat and what they cannot eat. Fruits are good in the sense that fruits have a lot of antioxidants, they have a lot of vitamins, they are readily available, they are seasonal, and for a lot of people, they are free. So if you tell people not to eat it, you know, I mean, that is a no brainer. So people can eat it, but within the context of their total caloric intake. I don't think that eating ripe fruits per se will cause diabetes. The second question again is that um, about herbs and natural treatments. Well, there are a lot of charlatans out there. You know, this is not to say that you don't have herbs or natural drugs that could work. All right, but we don't, we have not been able to develop an evidence base for them. Most of what people say is just anecdotal. Go and eat a wuro, go and eat a robo, go and eat this and that, and that it will cure your diabetes. But we don't have systematic evidence base for these uh, supposed, you know, uh, uh, results from some of these natural things. I'm not discountenancing them. And as Dr. Weifel said, even the US has a National Institute for Alternative and Complementary Medicine. We know that Chinese traditional medicine acupuncture yeah. and so on as hell with things like uh, our artemisinin derivatives came from Chinese herbal medicine. Yeah. So our pharmacognosists, our departments of pharmacy should probably go and get this oral tradition from our people and subject it to scientific analysis. With that will also be posology, dosage. You cannot say that people should bath with a liter of uh, some herbal concoction or take a gallon of this without really telling us about what the active constituent is and what the dosage should be. So as you said, Professor Gumola, that's the transition we need from yeah. an oral culture to a scientific culture, which we can document, which we can publish in world-class journals so that the rest of the world can participate with us. So I think there is the herbal medicine, there are natural cures, but we are still some distance from incorporating them into our everyday medical practice. Yeah, and just to join you on that, it's really for us to introduce weight and measure as part of our culture. Having, having um, uh, balances in our houses, having volume measuring devices, so that if we can know what the weight of an EBA that I've taken today, and we know how many calories a unit of that EBA is, it's also continuous. Those are, I think the scientific community has to promote the welfare of the community. And I think each and some of us should be getting together to promoting this. We just have to leave and do things that will profit or enhance those things that are aching us I want to see it happen in the next 100 years. Thank you. Yes, sir. Professor, uh, Dr. Kuku. Um, <clears throat> I, I think that um, Professor Kwaji has answered those questions very okay. well. Um, okay. I, I would like to look at insulin and how we can make it available. And Dr. Uh, uh, Professor Waifu, mentioned something very, very, very uh, astute. If you remember, India suddenly decided to overrun patents. Yes. And I am manufacturing these drugs. And they got away with it. Yes. Insulin uh, in Egypt was being manufactured without patent. And they were being sold at a fraction of the price. In Egypt, if you are caught smuggling insulin out, it's almost like bringing in drugs. Um, so, uh, if we, and then 
if you look at HIV drugs, South Africa decided that they are going to start manufacturing on their own. So this question of um, uh, patents and so on, unfortunately, um, many people have become lawless about it. It's not the best thing to do, but in the situation in which we are, to make it more available, we have to start manufacturing them here. And I, I believe that in many ways we solve it. There are, we study what India has done and what South Africa has done, what Egypt has done, and this will become more available. One Thank thing you. I also mm-hmm. one thing I also advocate is that the insurance, the third party payment must be strengthened. And the act, the uh, new health act, I think is doing will do, do a lot of that because it's now making it compulsory for everybody to take health insurance. And it's also making it available for poor people to be paid for for some special fund put aside by the government. And in the absence of that, diseases like diabetes, like kidney failure, like cancer, should be taken up immediately at the tertiary, at the federal government level and paid for. And I think that at least temporarily solve the problems that we need. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Waifo? Yes, I would just take, um, there's a question that uh, Dr. Jayasimi sent about the whole question of medication errors. And, and this is, it's, it's a great point. Insulin is unique in that it's a medication that really has no upper dose limit depending on the need. And it has a rather narrow therapeutic window. Um, there is no easy solution here. It will require, and this is where part of the advocacy that um, Dr. Foucault had mentioned would be important. Better education as to how insulin is used, timing relative to meals, um, Timing mean, relative to activity, all that needs to happen. And the American model has shown that it doesn't need to be a doctor that gives this sort of education. We have what we call certified diabetes educators. And the Chinese have, have um, pioneered the so-called barefoot doctors who can give basic health, health education um, to their fellow community members after being instructed. So, there are means and ways by which we can deliver the sort of instruction so that people can use the insulins that are available in a safe manner. Um, definitely availability of some of the technology I mentioned, longer acting insulins that are peakless, the so-called glucose responsive insulins or smart insulins will help reduce this issue of medication error. But for the now, it is education, education education. That's how we can reduce this risk. And then um, another question that I would just say a few words on. A question about um, from Dr. Udo, who was asking about the fact that despite the fact that um, insulin is so um, widely available and the cost is, it is becoming less and less affordable. Well, that is a reflection of the geopolitics that's involved. And Dr. Kuku has mentioned some of the things that that entails. We are not going to solve the question or the issue of the cost of insulin by following the same model that is used in most of West of the Western world. That, is, that much is clear. Um, I mentioned the, the India experience as an example, and Dr. Kuku has mentioned what happens in Egypt, what happens in South Africa. We are going to have to find a uniquely Nigerian solution. But something has to be done because um, we need access not just even to insulin, but to other biopharmaceuticals in a reasonably affordable fashion. It's going to need a change of the current paradigm that we have. Part of it is health insurance. Definitely. Universal health insurance has some utility, but we're also going to have to address it on the side of biopharma, um, chemistry, chemical industry. Um, And it will need a uniquely Nigerian solution.
Yeah, mute that, sir. Professor Gumola, you are muted. Am I? Are you hearing me now? Yes. yes. Yeah, you now. Okay. Okay. We'd like to thank our panelists for the fantastic presentation they've made to us. We've celebrated insulin in our own country. We think that insulin is welcome here. Then we're going to go look forward in the future and see what can be done to modify it, to make it serve a need. And I think we're calling on this scientific community to join us in this effort to make our scientific community serve our country and our nation. We're looking at India, you've talked about India, you've talked about, so everything you've talked about is a challenge to us. And I implore the academy to go ahead and fulfill it. I, won't, I have nothing but to just say extreme thanks to you all. And I hope, having requested that this be put in a publication that Dr. Akonji will lead as an editor as of this, uh, of this uh, to put together so that within the next six months, we can put an academy imprint on a book and call it our own contribution to the celebration of Insulin 100. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Akonji. Thank you, Dr. Koko, and thank you, Dr. White, for so interesting and challenging. I'm privileged and happy to have moderated this. And we thank okay. the president of the academy. I was about to thank the chairman, Professor Ogumola. <laughs> Okay, I'm over, yes. over to the president now to no, run. Yes. Yeah, you were about to forget yourself. So I said, I was about to thank our chairman because you were not here when I thanked you earlier. Okay. For 